Our guest today is Christine Gilbert. Christine taught for 18 years, eight of which was as a head teacher. She then went on to be the director of education in Harrow before moving to Tower Hamlets. There, she was first of all director of education and then chief executive of the council. In 2006, she became chief inspector of schools. Christine, welcome. Looking back, you, you taught for 18 years and became a head teacher of a secondary school at uh, the young age of 32. That was a, a very young head teacher for a secondary school. What was it like? It was a really um, chance in, in many ways. I just applied for three jobs and got this one. Um, but very soon after I was appointed, the school was identified for, for possible closure. Mm. It was one of three schools in the borough, so I then understood why they'd taken the risk well, of applying well because they <laughs> appointing me at that age. And, um, and actually, it was the best thing that could have ever happened to the school because the school um, pulled together and really focused on moving forward. And I learned everything I learned about leadership and management in that school, and but it was wonderful. When you say uh, it was uh, about to close, was that because of poor performance or falling numbers, or what? It was, um, it was, it was both. It was um, one of the, the, the report that produced by uh, the Education Committee at the time identified it as one of the lowest in terms of parental subscription, one of the lowest in terms of popularity, and the results weren't, weren't very good. So it was those, both those things. Um, what was it like when, by the time you left? It was the most oversubscribed school, and uh, the results were, were, were lots better. But actually, it was a very positive school. People liked teaching there, and, uh, and uh, it, it was a great thing yeah. to do, which is why I was so reluctant, really, to, to go on to another yeah. headship. And I was going to ask you about that, because at that point, you could have gone on and had a second headship, even three headships, and you didn't. You moved into local authority workers, I mean, right to the top as, as Director of Education, Harrow. Why, why didn't you go for a second headship? Well, to be totally honest, I wasn't sure what I'd wanted to do. I'd been there eight years, and uh, I'd had a secondment to develop local management of schools, um, but I'd gone back to the school. Presumably it was at the time before you had completely devolved budgets. It was, it was. It was at the time when I had to ask the local authority to get my windows fixed, right. which used to drive me mad. Um, so uh, I was a great, passionate advocate of the local management of schools. And of course in those days, um, I suppose it's fair to say, local authorities had more powers than they do now. This is before the days of the legislative changes. So thinking back, did you see yourself as going into a local authority to drive through school improvement? Because I often think there's a feeling around that people thought local authorities didn't think like that and that they were administrators rather than school improvers. So how did you, what was the situation in Harrow when you held that post? Well, I suppose really when I see what, what happened up and down the country, I was fortunate because Harrow was a very strong community of schools and colleges. And uh, it, it certainly the local authority added something to, to the schools. I never really remember uh, an age where it was it was where you told schools what to do and they did exactly it. Exactly right. Um, I um, I always saw it as a, as a, a leadership and an influencing role, and you, you had to you deserve you had to earn the leadership. You weren't the leader just mm. because you were director of education, as I was then. Mm. But you and then moved to, to Tower Hamlets, staying as director of education. So presumably by that time you'd made uh, a commitment to working in local authorities. But Tower Hamlets was so different. I mean, apart from it being the most deprived borough in the country, there was a national spotlight on, on spotlight on Tower Hamlets. It was the beginning of the Labour government, focus on literacy and numeracy. You must have seen that as a very high-profile, high-risk job when you moved there from Harrow. Uh, I didn't, really. Um, I, just, I just thought it sounded a, a, an interesting job. It, it wasn't quite as stark as you, you say, because I went just before the, the Labour government, and though there'd been a spotlight in the borough in terms of literacy and numeracy, actually they were trialling. They were they were trialling mm. those, and so, so I, the journey had already begun. It as had far started. As they were for uh, I went very unconvinced. I'd I'd always had uh, a real interest in in learn in teaching, um, reading actually as part of the work I was doing. I'd always had a, a focus on reading, certainly as a history teacher. Um, I did the Open University course on, on reading, yes. I think, in my second or third year, because I couldn't understand yeah. why these children in my class couldn't read and what could I do to, to help them read. So I'd been um, schooled, if you like, in the real book approach to reading, and I was completely yes. unconvinced by what I read in the paper mm. about what was happening there. 
But actually, I was there three months before I was completely convinced. Yeah. And Just, it was the fastest improving local authority in literacy and numeracy, I think, it, it, by, the it, it, by, by, um, by the end of the 90s. By the end of the 90s, it was, because you know, the, the really big difference between the two boroughs is that Harrow had very little money and, and Tower Hamlets had lots. Mm. Harrow had very few initiatives, unless they were self-generated. Mm. Mm. Um, Tower Hamlets had far too many initiatives. Yes. Uh, and no doubt one of the, the people in Tower Hamlets at that time was Ofsted itself. I mean, presumably when you were a head teacher there, there wouldn't have been Ofsted as we now know it. But I would imagine as Director of Education and then Chief Executive in Tower Hamlets, Ofsted were never out of your patch. Thinking back, what did you think of Ofsted? when you were at the receiving end of the inspections? I suppose looking back, um, I was a, a head um, and a teacher. There was no Ofsted, actually. I had lots of, um, lots of visits from HMI. Um, all, well, all apart from one, um, I felt I really learned something. What they did was they held a mirror up, really, mm. to mm. what was going on um, in, in the school and just helped me see, and the teachers actually, just see things slightly differently yes. so we could move on. So I was very, very positive always about HMI. When I became director, that's when Ofsted uh, was, was, was being introduced. And, and there, um, I, I saw in those early days, uh, Ofsted, the, the fact that it existed, the fact it was going to do inspections in that particular way, generate change mm. in some schools much more quickly. When I came to, to our Hamlets, of course, I'd only been there a few months we had one of the very early local authority um, I inspections, mm. which which didn't feel uh, terrifically positive at the time. Um, we did prepare. We probably prepared the wrong things, um, and it was generally very critical of the of the local authority. It talked about green shoots and so on, but was generally mm. critical. But actually, um, in, in retrospect, it was a major a major support, major catalyst, really, in helping the local authority move forward. I suppose, looking back at Ofsted, that relationship between teachers and Ofsted has, has always been of interest, of, of national interest, has always been an issue. What, what do you think is the right relationship, the correct relationship between Ofsted and the teaching profession? I mean, I, I would hope um, that, that Ofsted, particularly this new organisation that's been established since, since April, um, really supports improvement and, and is seen as a support for improvement. I do think there's some change. It's probably not coming through clearly enough to, to people from the outside yet. There is some change in the new uh, school inspections. Let's go on to look at some of those changes. I mean, one of the, there's, a, there's a number of features, I suppose. I wanted to look at them perhaps just in turn. I mean, one is the shorter notice. That's I think one of the things that may have made the relationship between Ofsted and the school better is that they've not got this terms notice of having to prepare all their paperwork and quite honestly getting themselves into a, a bit worked up about it. How has it worked in practice? Um, the fact that Ofsted just turned up with how many weeks notice now? How many days A couple notice? of days. A couple of days. You, know, you might get it? a phone call on a Friday and, and you might arrive the following Wednesday. But you know, a couple of two or three yeah. days how, notice. How's it, how's it worked? Um, well, it's, it's a very different animal really from the previous mm, mm. Uh, you know in intensive week of inspectors all, all over the school essentially it's a, it's it's a, it's a different test I think it's a it's trying to get at the nervous system of the school mm. if you like mm. and it's um, looking very hard at the school's own evaluation of itself because that unless that's really strong um, the development of the school isn't going to be mm. strong because for mm. me um, that's where real improvement lies in the school's analysis of itself and its, uh, its own planning uh, for moving forward. So the self-evaluation is, is really key. Um, and then the visit is key, you know, testing out mm. some of the hypotheses that the self-evaluation and the data have given us, I think, is key. Mm. And there's maybe another way of looking at this, that you are now very dependent upon their ability to evaluate what's going on in their schools. And maybe schools haven't always been good at that. It's not been something that we've put emphasis on. How are you finding that? How good are teachers and schools at evaluating their own progress? It's absolutely right what, what, what you said. We, we track, or I tracked back uh, um, after I'd arrived and, and looked, say, the, the last 10 years. And there's just been a dramatic improvement in school. It wasn't always called school evaluation, but it might have been school development and so on. But we tracked back through the um, evidence that we had just yeah. to see 
um, how things had progressed. And you, you, can't, you could see why it was um, secure enough now to be able to use schools' only, eva only evaluations of themselves. Is that true of every school? Because I think I can, I, I can readily accept that that's probably the case in the majority of schools, but that is becoming the way we inspect schools. So are, are you confident that the ability in all schools, even the most underperforming ones, to self-evaluate is such that you're happy with that? Or are you still got things up your sleeve that you will use if self-evaluation isn't going well in a school? Well, well the fact that we're still um, categorising schools as requiring special measures shows that all schools haven't got it right. I mean, some schools might have done that themselves, but very few. Mm. And sometimes there is a mismatch between what the school is saying about itself and what Ofsted inspectors are saying about itself, because they're... they're um, professionally testing out those judgments in a whole series of, of different ways. Essentially, it's a judgment on the school's senior management in many ways, um, how, how effectively the senior management of the school is, um, is leading and developing the school. Mm. You, you mentioned uh, schools in special measures, and I know that one of the great uh, arguments over the last 18 months has been the, the change in the, raising the bar, I think, as the profession tend to mention it, so that what happens now, you have to be better than you used to have to be to avoid going into um, serious weaknesses, special measures. You, you might well hear, hear that being said, because I think uh, schools have improved. I'm absolutely um, clear that schools have, have really improved. And I think it's right that, that we, we raise the bar, because people's expectations mm, mm, of schools mm. um, ha has also mm. been raised. And I think you can't just be ever be uh, complacent and just stand still. Even the best schools, I think, well, actually, it's usually a characteristic of the best mm. schools that they're not content. They always want to do to do better. Yes. As the, are these changes, this I suppose package of changes that we've seen, just in how we inspect schools, not the wider structural changes. Would, do you see that as a natural evolution from where Ofsted started, or has it in part been a response to the pressures that teachers? have put on you and said, look, you know, Ofsted's denying us our creativity and the rest of it? Um, my, my guess is, because I, I, I wasn't there, but, but um, talking to colleagues, if not about that particular point, I get the impression that to, to, uh, to some degree it, it was um, an evolution. But there was, that there was also, I think, a belief that one size fits all was, yeah. was no longer right. And while it was important to have a universal framework, if you like, um, that they really, we shouldn't be doing um, the, the same amount of inspection activity in a school that's high performing mm. and a school that isn't. So the school that isn't really responds much more um, to more frequent visits and so, so on. So it's given you flexibility. That... It, it, it has. It's given us a, a proportionate approach to mm. inspection. So a very light touch in some of the schools now mm. um, and um, more support for satisfactory schools who have got some real problems in one or two areas, but also in, um, in schools that are in special measures, who absolutely, well, almost completely, will, will tell you how positive the, the experience has been for the school. But how confident are you, or what systems do you have in place to make sure that the inspectors you send into schools are fit for purpose? I've been um, really impressed with the way that, that Ofsted has done that. As you, as you probably know, the inspections are contracted out but uh, with the new system, um, part of the deal, if you like, with the, uh, I understand, in the consultation was that um, HMI would lead more of them than they had done in right. the past. So HMI lead about 75%, um, three quarters of the ones in secondary and a much lower percentage of the ones in Did it used to, what, what figure did it used to be? I hadn't realised there'd been that Not change. sure, but, but, but no is, this is a dramatic change. No, I hadn't this that. is a, is a dramatic change. We, we, but beyond that, we have um, a, a very detailed process for checking quality mm. of the contracted inspectors. It's mm. a very strong, secure system. And there's and a right of appeal now, of course, the, to the, 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 the There is a right of appeal, and I have been really keen to say mm. to people, if you don't like it, uh, if something went wrong, please complain yes. so that we can think about what you've told us and we'll learn um, from what you're saying. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about that area of the curriculum that's not easily weighed and measured, the sort of, I suppose, what you might sort of creative subjects, at expressive arts. There's, there's often been a feeling that either they get left out because we've, we're not good at finding uh, data or descriptors to measure progress, 
or that to some extent they're overlooked and therefore schools don't concentrate on that area of the curriculum. Are you conscious of that and how, how do you think we can move on so that people like Ofsted, if you like, the whole of the education bureaucracy gives a clear measure that they are very valued parts of the curriculum. It's just that we can't weigh and measure them in the same way. I think it isn't to do with weighing and measuring because if you could just really weigh and measure even the other, other subjects, um, it still wouldn't give you the picture that an Ofsted report gives you because the Ofsted report does look at the school in its entirety yeah. and I think at most of them you get a strong sense of um, what the school is doing in the round mm, mm. and the, the schools that are outstandingly good, are good pay attention to all of those, mm. all of those areas. And I, I think there's, there's um, a lack of clarity about what Ofsted inspects some, mm. expects sometimes. Mm. Um, and I think you can have um, very innovative, way, innovative ways of, of approaching the curriculum and still come out with a very good Ofsted inspection mm. report. One of the things that we've been trying to do and have, uh, have done, I think, with some success, is to use um, thematic reviews, survey reviews. So very soon after I was appointed, there was a report produced on creative partnerships, yes. for instance, which was, which was really um, interesting. I gave a talk um, a couple of months ago on citizenship, so I had to read all of the previous reports on that. So Ofsted has, has always done this, um, and I think it picks up good practice, but I, I, I'd like, I want to do some more in terms mm. of the impact of those reports, mm. because I think everybody reads the school reports, yes. um, but people don't, unless they're very interested in this area anyway, pick up some of these thematic and survey That's right. reports. And that becomes a problem, doesn't it? Because we've got now parents of your child's in year six about to go to secondary school. Is there that worry that as a society, particularly parents, they can over rely on Ofsted and not realise that it's only one source of information that they should take into account? I think if they did that, it, it, it would be worrying, but I don't think parents do do that. And the parents I talk to don't do that. Um, some of them will look at the Ofsted reports, some of them have children in the school, some of them ask their friends, uh, they go and visit the school, they talk to the head, talk to the teachers and so on. They use a range of, of information and evidence to make their judgments a, about the school, I think. Ofsted, I want Ofsted reports mm. to be part of that. But it's important, I think, that they, they think about the, the other things too. Mm. I think you've, done, you've had one annual, one annual yeah. report so far, and it, it was a really interesting example of what can happen. Yeah. You, we got the raised bar, so we had more schools that had been thought to need extra support and intervention. And yet you were quite clear in your report that you thought it was an improving education system. And yet you experienced the headlines of more schools in special measures, more failing schools. Did that come, well I suppose it didn't come as a shock to you because you've had senior posts before, but how do you deal with that when your every word now is going to be hung on by the press? How, how do you handle that? Is it something that you're aware of and you worry about? I was, I was really careful that the, the annual report was produced very soon mm, after. It was. Uh, it was my commentary, but the report was done before I, I arrived and I thought hard about the presentation. I thought it was very important to give some hard messages mm. because the number of schools that are still inadequate is just not good mm. enough. Uh, and we have really got to address that and that's a problem for all of us. But actually, the, 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 the balance was, actually, was on the positive. Um, I did talk about the improving system and so you on, did. and I was really struck by the, the Sun headline, which was fail, fail, yes. fail. Yeah. Um, it must and, be infuriating uh, when you put that much effort into getting a, an accurate and balanced report to see that sort of headline. I suppose I, I, I um, uh, you know, after uh, almost 10 years in Tower Hamlets, um, <laughs> I, I, um, it, they don't have that, doesn't have that yeah, I, no, impact true. on me. But we, we followed it with um, eight receptions up and down the country for outstanding um, yes. childcare settings and um, head teachers and, and principals absolutely no interest at all from the from the national press there was some interest in a few of them from the local press and I think that's often that's the local often press the are good at picking up absolutely local successes, and, and that in some ways matters more to um, individual schools yeah. than the Sun's headline and so yeah. on. Just something um, we have to learn to live with, I suppose. The, the, the thing about the negative publicity, though, does 
raised the problem and I think it's important to make all of us feel uncomfortable mm. about um, inadequate provision and the damage it's doing to, to children and young people. So I don't feel apologetic about that, but it's just it's making sure that there are other things happening as well mm. to get I, the balance right. And of course I think it is helpful when the press are able to look at the data that are now produced through offset in inspections because the statistics are quite clear that white boys is an area of underachievement. So are ethnic mi minority students. You'll know this from Tar Hamlets, particularly boys again. But if you actually delve down into those figures, last time I looked at them, I was both surprised and pleased about the progress, the huge progress that some ethnic minorities are now making in terms of attainment. Uh, Pakistani boys, I think, have improved after Caribbean girls. And yet with white boys, we don't seem to have made that progress. I think what I wanted to ask you, Christine, about that is that the nation as a whole, because of the political and social context in which we're operating at the moment, seems much more attuned sometimes to looking at what to do about ethnic groups who are underachieving and seems less attuned, has less of a conversation as to what to do about white boys, particularly in the inner city, who are underachieving. This isn't just a matter for Ofsted, but looking across that area, do you think that we actually put enough resources, enough effort into underachievement of white boys compared to other underachieving groups? I, I do. Um, I mean, I, I think we're, we're more data rich than we've ever been. Um, and I, I think we have to be really careful that it just doesn't lead to simple answers about different things. It does just do what you're suggesting. It asks you to focus on particular groups and the progress of those groups in the particular school and nationally and asks questions about those, those groups. Now, on one level, when I, I, I first, just before I came to, to Ofsted, I, I asked for a presentation because I was worried that in an area like Tower Hamlets, it would depress achievement. It would tell the schools that they were doing brilliantly um, by their Bangladeshi children. Yes. And actually, those, those children were still not above national, mm. um, national averages, which they can and should be. And certainly in Tower Hamlets, there'd been an investment of significant funds um, about white uh, working yes. class boys. But there was also in Tower Hamlets an issue about white working class girls. Yes. And the issue of class, I think, is something that, that we need to, yes. to disentangle. But to some extent, I mean, it's, it's inevitable that to some extent, where you put your resources and effort into looking at those underachieving groups and asking the questions must partly be determined by the wider context. So at the moment, when we're very worried about racially segregated schools with underachievement of people, perhaps, for instance, for, for, from the Muslim communities, do you find yourself responding to that national agenda? Or do you keep calm, say, look at all the figures, ask the questions about all the groups? I've always tried to keep calm about the national agenda because you, you, you need to be confident about what you're doing in a school, in a local authority and in Ofsted. Uh, if you're really clear about where you're going and what, what your real and purpose is. And not be blown is, by the And not be blown concern. off, um, not blown off course. I remember all sorts of things yes. uh, in Tower Hamlets that might have done that um, to us. And so I, I, I think you, you obviously listen and you reflect, but you don't let it d d deflect you. And I, I think the, the focus on groups is fine, but actually it's what's happening in the, the classroom between the, the child, the learner, and the mm. person doing the teaching is, is, is really key. And that demands an element of pre precision that isn't easy to capture in these sorts of figures, I think. Right, that goes beyond the figures to some extent. We said we'd talk about the new expanded remit um, of Ofsted. I suppose it's it's almost inspecting the world at the moment. It's got early years and it's got adult learning as well. Is there a risk that it's too big, too unfocused? We, um, we, 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 don't, think, we don't think so. We think it's, it'll help us do a, a more effective job for children and learners right across the, the piece. It is a big job. We've, we've worked out that conservatively, the, the, the new organisation um, it touches more than a third of people in the country and the services that we're inspecting. And so we, we are taking that really seriously. Right. But we think bringing these four organisations together, merged into this new Ofsted, is going to give us the potential for a greater, greater change and greater improvement and a better deal for mm -hmm. children and learners. And making the connections will be much easier for us to do in the, in the like new children, organization. Looked after children, for example. Abs that would absolutely. Make a... It's a really good example of being able to either 
focus on uh, mm. looked after children from two, three, yes. all the way up to 17 or 18. Already, already there's um, been joint work, but I think over the next few years, we'll re really make it much more integrated and much more mm. focused. I suppose in almost everyone's mind, Ofsted is, is still associated with schools. Do you, I mean, presume you want to change that, you want to change the country's perception of what Ofsted is now. I think the phrase you learned was to inspect you know, opportunities for, te for, 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 for learners, right? from naught to whatever. So is that going to be one of your priorities to sort of reframe Ofsted in the public's mind as a, that wider inspector? I, I wouldn't want to lose um, the, the force of Ofsted as a brand. And the force of Ofsted as a brand, I think everybody would, would admit, has come from its role with schools because so many people mm. um, uh, have, have children in school and have seen and heard of an Ofsted report. But that doesn't mean that the other areas aren't equally important and uh, we need to be focusing much more on the whole. But I wouldn't want to diminish the, uh, the focus on school inspection um, at, at the cost in, the new, in the new Ofsted. Uh, Christine, you've had a lot of years, I mean, all your working life, I think, has been in education. You talk about it with passion, but at the same time, you are, given your present role, fully aware of the weaknesses and what we need to do. Are you an optimist? about the future of our education system? And would you describe yourself as one of these people for whom think the bottle is always half full or the bottle half empty? I, I'm absolutely positive and confident about um, the, the developments um, and the potential of, um, of, of education and decent care in terms of the, of the development of uh, people's lives and so on. And though most of my working life has been um, in education. Actually, the last five years were as chief executive of a local authority yes, where true. I had a much broader view. And even in that, that view, it, it seemed to me the sorts of issues that we've been talking about are absolutely central if you really want to regenerate an area properly. It, it's absolutely down to the children and young people, the learning that's going on and the care that's going on in that area for, for people as individuals. Christine Gilbert, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.